you. Thank you. Am I reading today? Uh, <laughs> I want to thank Wyatt and Barbara and Megan and Adam and the marvelous staff, um, and especially Nathaniel, who was our point man for the translation workshop, and Alicia, uh, uh, my co-teacher, and our wonderful workshop. We just had a marvelous time. Um, there's a kind of, I think, subterranean conversation in the, in the, uh, through the workshop um, about the idea of community. And I thought tonight, uh, to this afternoon, I would read some poems dealing with, with different kinds of communities that I'm a part of, uh, willingly or unknowingly or whatever. Um, uh, my closest uh, college friend uh, came down to Tennessee with his wife and uh, taught at Murfreesboro at, at Middle Tennessee State and uh, produced two sons, uh, one of whom married my daughter. So a kind of friendship developed into a, a, an extended family. And about five years ago, Michael passed away, and uh, his wife asked me if I would write something for a secular uh, uh, memorial service. And my limited experience left me wondering, OK, I knew what I shouldn't write, but what should I write? <laughs> um, and at uh, visiting my son-in-law, I found a copy, he's a very good cook, and I found a copy of Bon Appetit. And I was reading it, and I came across a passage so outrageously over the top pretentious that I could hear Michael laughing in my ear as I read it. And I thought, well, uh, I'll write something that would please or will please, I, any tense will do, uh, my friend Michael. Uh, so I, I, I wrote a ballad, which is a medieval form, uh, and it's a form that's written in stanzas. At the end of each stanza, there's a little a refrain line, and there's a little coda at the end, and the, uh, uh, there's a, an address uh, to a prince in the poem. The prince usually was the man who was in charge of the, ball the guild of ballad makers, and the idea was uh, show your favor by allowing me into the guild as a result of this work. Uh, I left it in because it was too hard to take it out. <laughs> and I'll read the ballad, uh, starting with uh, the quotation that inspired it from Bon Appetit. Oh, there's a phrase, uh, uh, a French phrase, avec une sauce au beurre which just means with, with a butter sauce. <laughs> Somewhere between polishing off a bowl of fried to order pork rinds at La Bette in Seattle and downing handfuls of popcorn dusted with apple cider powder at Barbuzzo in Philadelphia, it hit me. <laughs> We're living in a golden age of bar <laughs> snacks. Though many that we do not know starve in places worse than cruel, where children die or fail to grow, though there are those who live immured in crowded cells on thin gruel, what's that to us who are assured we'll never dine on wormy hardtack in this golden age of the bar snack? If icebergs fall and oceans rise, if few of us can breathe the air and Gaia offers a surprise, as water pours from taps of fire, I offer this against despair. No situation's truly dire. Ignore the heat that melts the tarmac in this golden age of the bar snack. 
If terrorism north and south turns distant nations into hell and makes of many one dumb mouth, why should we care if they survive? The point of life is to live well. Some fade away while others thrive. Go you ever all that far back from this golden age of the barsnack. No problem, Prince, should you prefer unflavored almonds to the grilled dormouse avec une sauce au beurre. <laughs> Your wish will surely be fulfilled. Lightly braised oyster, prawn charred black in this golden age of the bar snack. <laughs> I am as some of you may know, a, a city boy, though I grew up in the South, in the South Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here we go. Uh, but I've been talking uh, uh, in conversations at French House, and I, I came here with the idea that Kentucky, for instance, was a uh, wooded area populated by the geniuses of Thomas Merton and Guy Davenport and Elizabeth Hardwick and Eugene Metyard, and, and I still have that conviction. I know there are living geniuses. I'm only speaking of those who have passed on. Uh, but years ago, I came to a place in northeastern Vermont which had the same sort of attraction for artists and writers, a very rural underpopulated area. And uh, it was the home of uh, a, an artist named Peter Schumann who started something called Bread and Puppet Theater, which was a kind of community theater, radical uh, uh, theater that created amazing puppets, very surrealistic kinds of images. Um, and uh, they started off on the Lower East Side of New York. His wife inherited a dairy farm, and they found themselves <laughs> with this strange theater in, in uh, northeastern Vermont. Uh, and they used to go around on the 4th of July uh, and get into parades in local towns. So you'd see you know, a few fire trucks would go by, and then these strange demonic creatures with masks you know, marching in the parade. Everybody seemed to like it, and everybody got along in a, in a strange but really interesting sense of community. Uh, so this is, uh, I, I wrote a poem that described the 4th of July parade uh, one year, and it was published in the local paper, and I'll read it now. Uh, it's called Making Faces. It's in three parts. Uh, the first part is called the world. It begins with a little quotation from D.H. Lawrence. We begin to see that it is better to keep life fluid and changing than to try to hold it down fast in heavy monuments. Give us things that are alive and flexible, which won't last too long and become an obstruction and a weariness. One, the world. Every year there is a big parade in Barton, Vermont on the 4th of July when we celebrate the red, white, and blue, during the course of which we see displayed some of the Pentagon's old weaponry, an armored car, a Sherman tank or two, and martial, add martial tone to the festive atmosphere. Behind them come the bread and puppet theater, beginning with someone in a horse's head who's holding up a sign that says the world as though the world were next in their procession or their procession were the world instead. And next to the horse there walks a little girl ringing a school bell for our attention. The world we see approaching is a cart drawn by puppet oxen, their huge necks bent their tranquil heads sweeping from side to side. The world is filled with artless works of art, miniature figures that must represent the people of the world out for a ride. 
and the cart so full of them that one might say, no one at all has been left home today. The world has drawn beside us now and soon will pass us by, will pass us by as the clouds pass us by overhead. The clouds move at their own pace, and so to us they hardly seem to move, those ghostly gray-white oxen of the sky drawing the world through realms of empty space. This world addresses the fragility of the only other one we have to live in, where the marble-breasted laborers grow weak and crumble to their knees and shortly die where the poor must eat the stones that they are given, and the little painted figures fall and break, and the extraordinary cloud-drawn cart we thought would last forever comes apart. What happens next in the parade, we ask? We haven't long to wait before our answer. Behind the cart drawn by the puppet oxen comes a stilted figure in a jackal mask, pounding on a drum. This dog-faced dancer raises a clangorous, dissonant toxin. Two, the end of the world. We've practiced it too often in our age to see it merely as the subtraction of bird from tree, of tree from earth, of earth from space, as one erases letters from a page. Yet we still think of it as an abstraction, something that isn't likely to take place, although it's taken place at places called Guernica, Hiroshima, Buchenwald. We think of the unthinkable with ease. We've had such practice of it for so long and speak of it in ways which help conceal from ourselves the dark realities that numb the mind and paralyze the tongue. And now in the parade, there comes a skeletal figure on a skeletal horse made of raw strips of pine lashed together. Its attitude is distant yet familiar, as though it were confident that in the course of time we'd get to know each other better. It knows this in its bones as we in ours. And so, if death should ever wave at you, you may wave back, for you have manners too. You needn't ask it to slow down or stop. It's followed by a dragon belching smoke. One demon drives it, another one attends to the great devourer who sits on top, quietly enjoying some huge cosmic joke. And that is the way the end of the world ends. Three, fight the end of the world. Now Peter Schumann, dressed as Uncle Sam, strides down Main Streets on his outrageous Sorry, let me do that again. Now Peter Schumann, dressed as Uncle Sam, strides down Main Street on his outrageous stilts, carrying a sign that says, watch out. A younger Uncle Sam prances around him, intricately weaving subtle steps under his teacher's exaggerated strut. They make it look so easy, someone says. They dance before a ragtime band that plays molto con brio, more or less on key, for there are many fine musicians in it, and they raise a noise unto the uh, and they raise a joyful noise unto the Lord of all creation. The heart willingly gives it assent, but the mind says, "Wait a minute, is this how we're to fight the end of the world?" by making faces at appalling forces and marching off to the parade grounds with one's friends and neighbors, honest country folk changed into demons, dogs and demi-horses, or into oxen who present the world as myth, straining together underneath their yoke, by building things so that they cannot last unreasonably long, by honoring the past but raising up no wearisome immense rock for all ages, by rudely waking the child in us and teaching it to play, by going with the grain and not against, by shaping our daily bread 
and baking thick, thick crusted loaves of it to give away. We've seen the world as it was passing through and monstrous death, the world devouring, and a man on stilts whose artistry astounded. And now we have a sanitation crew sweeping and shoveling up dragon dung, leaving, leaving the streets as spotless as they found it. My questions beg an answer as do I. Some kind of answer may be given by the garbage man who shakes hands with my son and daughter and then goes back to join his friends or the washerwoman in her faded dress on a holiday from work that's never done with whom most fittingly the pageant ends. As she passes by, her sign says only, yes. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Northeastern Vermont had one of those museums in it uh, where you, uh, which is full of things that people uh, bring or send back from their travels in, in uh, where they've gone and they're put into the museum in Vermont. Um, and uh, one of them was a, a, a gigantic polar bear upright in a glass case. And uh, when I first went there, there was a sign on the front of the case that said, you know, you, polar bear shot by commander so-and-so, U.S. Navy, uh, 1954. And when I went back again more recently, there was a sign that said endangered species. <laughs> those are the, those signs have spread, uh, uh, and I've, uh, it led me to to this poem, which is called "Getting Carded." It's a shorter. It's much shorter. We couldn't know what we would lose when the endangered species sign began to turn up in our zoos. A small white card propped up on a shelf in front of the cage or pen of one selected for this honor, translated from its habitat into a compact modern flat. By what endangered or by whom, it couldn't know until too late. One day it woke up in this room where it patrols compulsively the borders of its shrunken state and stares at what it cannot see far dominions, other powers. Its glance keeps on avoiding ours. You wonder why it didn't learn, although quite frankly, it seems not even to share your mild concern. Time to move on. The fourth grade class behind us wants to claim our spot and press its faces to the glass. We leave endangered and its text and wonder who'll get carded next. Uh, another another a sort of animal poem. I swore I wouldn't do that flipping thing. <laughs> Uh, this is called Ara Pacus, which uh, is Latin for altar of peace, and it's the name of a monument in Rome um, uh, which shows a, a procession of figures around the altar, heading for the altar to give sacrifice. Uh, to, and and uh, underneath some of the figures, there's a pig and a sheep, and you can sort of imagine the sheep saying, Hey, we're having a procession. <laughs> Won't this be why? And the pig is saying, this is not going to end well. <laughs> <clears throat> so this is our Apacus. The white procession halts at the altar of peace to give thanks for war ended on such splendid terms. And someone deposits a shit-stained lump of fleece on the high marble table where it writhes and squirms 
unquietly bleeding, legs slipping and flailing, and any prayer of its will be unavailing. <clears throat> Another kind of community, I guess. Um, I'll read a poem uh, that is about a community I did not know I was part of until pretty recently. Um, some time ago, my wife and I uh, sent our DNA off to be tested uh, by National Geographic. And when the results came back, there we were. We were Neanderthals. Uh, when I was a child, we had a, a, an encyclopedia that had pictures of the Neanderthals, and back in those days, they were regarded as, as barely human monsters, you know. But now we know that they are more or less uh, indistinguishable from us. <laughs> and um, so I'm happier about that. But this. <laughs> This is a poem called A Burial at Shanadar, and it's, um, uh, what happened was that uh, some paleontologists discovered uh, evidence that of, of Neanderthal burial uh, and burial with flowers, which struck me as fabulous. Uh, I wrote the poem before I knew that I was a member of the Neanderthal <laughs> community, so. Men of our kind, digging in the cellar of a cave, uncovered what was hidden, bones that from steeping in the earth's strong tea for countless years had taken on its color. But were those bones just tossed onto the midden, or had they been buried? A mystery. The soiled fragments of a salvaged skull at first said nothing but Neanderthal, Bones in better repair, appearing beneath that skull's dyed egg, allowed them to recover a specimen long crippled by disease, worn out at 40, arthritic since his birth, a burden on the group, which had, however, provided him with his necessities, and afterwards had buried him and mourned with ceremony, as our cavemen learned. For when they sent the matter of that site to be examined by a botanist in Europe, she immediately found the remnants of a grave, a shallow pit lined with pine branches on which he'd been placed. Before the group had scattered all around what never could have gotten there by chance, cornflowers, hollyhock, grape hyacinth, their custom noted in the dried out pollen of long gone flowers dropped by hands the same, as fleeting as the shadows on the wall that flickered in firelight around the fallen. How hesitantly, awkwardly they came forward to celebrate his funeral, those dim, unsightly ancestors of ours clutching their little spray of wildflowers and uttering their almost human cries of unsuccess. As shambling, grotesque, they stood around the figure in the grave and mumbled what might have meant, take these, which we have gathered at no little risk in the wild places far beyond the cave. We thought to honor you, the reasons why would perish with the last of them to die. <clears throat> I'll read. This is a poem um, not, not really about uh, community so much as, I suppose, one attitude toward community. It, it's called For the End of the Age of Irony. Uh, I think... I think that irony uh, is, you know, is in many ways a necessary, a necessary skepticism is a good thing these days. Um, and it, it 
perhaps does more to help establish and maintain a community than we're, we're aware of. So this is, uh, the other reason why I wanted to read it is because we've been talking in our workshop about this kind of, array, the Alcaic Ode, and it, it's an Al um, poem in the Alcaic meter. So it, if it's ever reprinted again, it's going to begin with a quotation uh, by Donald Justice, who said, I felt touched by an emotion I must have been inventing. So for the end of the age of irony. Why, if it's gone now, is there this leftover ambience seeping into and staining the fabric of our conversation like red wine spilled on the bone white sofa? Though its infrequent sightings are treated as cases of mere mistaken identity, and though its age may now be ended, it seems that irony is not quite done for. One old employer pays it occasional visits on Sunday, riding a trolley car out to the suburbs where it lingers, though much diminished, as he informs us. Odd to contrast, its formerly vigorous habits of growth, its flourishing presence in those lives to which it once seemed central, with its now marginal situation, off in the corner, fusty leaves withering. If only we'd remembered to water it every so often. Yes, if only with our crocodile tears, if only such insincere remorse may remind you of how you enjoyed the late Donald Justice's version of Baudelaire's evasive elegy made for the clumsy servant. Wondering only whether the French version should be preferred for its insincerity, insincerity over the translator's nostalgia for those emotions he never suffered. It may seem strange that an inability to speak of irony without irony argues more clearly for its value than any argument it's not part of, or that nostalgia is the more keenly felt out of proportion to the experience causing it, as a magnifying lens will make any poor micro macro. But you were always taken with artifice drawn to it like a sow to a truffle bed, weren't you? Finding it a refuge from the unbearably lofty motive as from the unendurable punditry of those whom mere self-interest animates. You saw it deftly undermining acres of wind-powered bloviators and noticed how when we get too serious in its defense, it vanishes utterly. Ironists surely would consider such an odd outcome as, well, ironic. Better to leave its fragile and fugitive self to recover with our negligence offering it all it really needs for any eventual restoration, which someone someday on one reality, many perspectives, will lightly illustrate merely by letting you know that the beautiful necktie you're wearing isn't. <laughs> <clears throat> I have a new book out this year. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to read some poems from it. I'll read fewer of them because they, they are sort of longer. Uh, many of them are persona poems, uh, some narrative poems. <clears throat> and I'll, read, I'll read a few of these, uh, largely to please my editor who said he was coming here today. I, oh, there he is. <laughs> <clears throat> when I was in college, uh, the hottest little magazine around was something called uh, the, uh, uh, it was published by Grove Press, the Evergreen Review, and they published Allen Ginsberg and William Burroughs and people like that. And uh, they published a short story called Blue Eyes by Octavio, uh, sorry, The Blue Bouquet by Octavio Paz. 
And um, it's haunted me for many, many years, and I wrote a poem based on the story, and then I reworked the poem again, this time for the, for the book. So I'm, I'm reading it partly because we've been talking in the class about uh, taking stuff by other writers and using it, transforming it, changing it in some slight way, maybe, and, and, and uh, moving it out. Art, uh, Leslie Fiedler used to say, sometimes imitates nature, but it always imitates art. So, Blue Eyes, by Octav after Octavio Paz. Uh, the speaker is a traveling salesman in some part of Mexico, unspecified, who is telling the story years later to someone else. <clears throat> and it, it's at a time when everybody smoked and when in Mexico you would buy not, uh, you would buy little packets of wooden matches for your cigarettes. That shows, it comes up later. You know what those provincial towns are like. Just one hotel and just one restaurant where you can get a decent meal. And after that, nothing to do but stroll around the square, watching the locals watching you, till boredom or despair drives you back to your room. I got in shortly before dark, unpacked my samples, freshened up. Downstairs, the hotel clerk mentioned a cafe that he liked, one close enough to walk to. The usual, but clean and with a waitress there to talk to, a young girl, pretty and flirtatious. Shortly, it appeared the night might not be quite as uneventful as I'd feared. I had a brandy after dinner, smoked a cigarette, then someone outside called to her and beaming my coquette took off her apron and took off at once. End of story. So with no prospects for the night, a busy day before me, I saw that it was time to pack it in, retread the path that I had taken here back to my room and bed. But all the shops along the street were shuttered for the night. And as I might have known, there were no other source of light. I set out walking blindly, then went on and on until I realized that I was lost, stopped walking, and stood still. The footsteps I'd been hearing abruptly stopped when minded. I felt that I'd been drawn into a labyrinth that winded inward in response to my confusion and distress. And then as I was passing by a shadowy recess, I caught a glimpse of some slight movement in that cul-de-sac. And someone seized me from behind while one hand drew me back into the deeper darkness there. The other calmly brought the pressure of a cold steel blade hard against my throat. Be careful now, don't move, he said. I have a razor here and men will sometimes choose unwisely on account of fear. I said, my wallet's in. He said, you don't quite comprehend. Your wallet isn't what I want from you tonight, my friend. It isn't all that simple. I can only wish it were. My woman asks me for this, and I do it to please her. For she has told me that she wants, imagine my surprise, Tomorrow, for her birthday, a bouquet of eyes, blue eyes. Yes, they must all of them be blue. I couldn't answer him. The thought of losing both my eyes to satisfy a whim. That is the only reason why I've interrupted you. I have to have your eyes by tonight, my friend, if they are blue. My eyes are not that color, I said, look, they are dark brown. He took the razor from my throat, but didn't put it down. Matches, he said, and light one now. I heeded his command. The cardboard box was rattling in my unsteady hand so fiercely that I dropped the flaring match. 
Again, he said, and so I struck another match that flared up like my dread. Now hold it closer to your eyes. Hold up that little torch. I held it up until my, I felt my lashes start to scorch. The match had burned down to my fingers when he blew it out. I should have trusted you, my friend. Can you forgive my doubt? He let me go, and in a moment he had disappeared. I fell back into darkness, but not blind as I had feared, and still alive, or so it seemed. For a long time I lay in shock until I managed to get up and make my way back to the hotel, next morning packed and fled that place, driving as swiftly as I could away from my disgrace. You realize that I had lied to him. My eyes are blue. Did he miss that? The flaring match? How can I know if he knew? It's possible he only meant to test me, I suppose. But did I pass or fail that test? Who else but that man knows? Let me just check the time and make sure. Okay, we're on. Um, a while ago, I, I had uh, spent an afternoon with a friend of mine, John Urban, who was writing a book uh, about Weldon Keyes, the American poet. And uh, it got me interested in rereading Keyes, and Keyes became a, a kind of character in, in my poetry. Um, I took a letter of his, and it, it was, I loved the letter, and I thought I could turn this into verse. I could make something different out of it. So I did. It's a, a letter that he wrote as a young man uh, going to a party in New York with all sorts of literary people whom he had read, but some of, most of them he hadn't met yet. Um, so there are people from the 1940s and 50s. Keyes was a mid-century writer, uh, um, and um, the people are all people like Ed Edmund Wilson, W.H. Uh, Auden, Mary McCarthy, uh, people who are active in the literary scene in, in the middle of the century. Um, and I love the, just the, the rhythm of it, and, and well, here's, here's what came out. It's called, Mr. Keyes Goes to a Party. The Wilsons had just moved back into town from summering on Wellfleet's Money Hill. Edmund was in a very grumpy mood, and Anne, who hadn't ever met before the author of Axel's Castle and much else, was shocked a little by his crabbiness. There were two people whose names I didn't catch. It turned out one of them was Philip Rice of the Kenyan Review. I spent half an hour trying to figure out just who they were. Wilson repeatedly called Philip Rice Mr. Wheelwright. Unable to surmount his own confusion, he demanded, you are Philip Wheelwright, are you not? Which may be why Rice asked me sotto voce, is everybody crazy in New York? <laughs> Mary McCarthy was busily explaining who the real heroine of the Golden Bowl is, while Natalie Rav told me all, what all was wrong with Dwight MacDonald, and an argument broke out behind me over the correct pronunciation of Randall Jarrell's last name. Wilson burst out with accent on the last syllable, adding that Jarrell was just an adolescent whose infantile obsessions were all that made his poetry worth reading. The Wilsons left the party before we did. We left with Rice and the man whose name I'd missed, although I'd somehow learned he lived and taught in Philadelphia. I asked him what he taught. Until this spring, until this spring, I used to be the head of Romance Languages at Haverford. My wife was four months pregnant with our first baby, and then she shot herself one day. 
Now he spends Tuesday evenings with Auden. It seems that Auden's in a bad way, too. Isherwood's off in Hollywood translating the Gita with his guru, who's a swami. But what he really wants to do, of course, is write a novel about Hollywood. Christopher, said our new, still nameless friend, was fascinated by the last tycoon. I'll read one more of the Keys things. This is called The Afterlife of Mr. Keys. Weldon Keys parked his car uh, in 1955 by the Golden Gate Bridge and was never seen again. And, and the assumption is that he leapt from the bridge. Um, the day after his uh, disappearance, his friends uh, called some police to come to his apartment because they wanted to see if there was evidence of a crime. And what happened is something that happened uh, is almost a trope in Keyes' poetry. A phone will ring and there'll be nobody at the other end. The phone rang. One of the policemen answered. Then he put the handset down on the cradle and told the others that no one had been at the other end. The phone was ringing, and to make it stop, oh, I should say this is a villanelle. The phone was ringing, and to make it stop, he answered it. Not what you would expect. It wasn't nobody, announced the cop. Friends of his said that Keyes seemed full of hope two days before. Did none of them suspect? The phone kept ringing, and it wouldn't stop, repeating its summons to adjust and cope, even as Keyes made plans to disconnect. It wasn't nobody, announced the cop, who yesterday had missed Keyes poised atop the polished railing, momently erect. A phone was ringing, and Keyes made it stop by tilting forward till he began to drop from a vertiginous sheer height, unchecked. It wasn't nobody, announced the cop. Waves still spread out from Key's great belly flop at frequencies now harder to detect, a phone that rings unheard and will not stop. It wasn't nobody, announced the cop. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to read one uh, poem, one more poem. It's a poem in seven parts, so you're not getting off that easy. Uh, and it wasn't even wine for lunch. You all came. That's wonderful. Um, this is a, a, a poem based on something uh, a dis that happened or was discovered in uh, a place called Laitoli, which is in Tanzania. Uh, one of Mary Leakey's, the paleontologist Mary Leakey, her, one of her students discovered uh, a trail about the length of a, 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 an Olympic swimming pool, uh, full of all sorts of tracks. And in the tracks, they discovered humanoid tracks. Uh, which were identified as Australopithecus tracks from three million years ago. Uh, the, the track has been studied uh, intensely, it's been copied, and it's now been buried to keep it from vandalism. Um, uh, I wrote the poem about it just out of, because I wanted to. Uh, <laughs> It's called From Certain Footprints Found at Light Holy, and it's in seven parts. It's a, a kind of crown of sonnets. Uh, these are odd sort of couplet sonnets that are 16 lines long, but the last line of one poem becomes the first line of the next and so on. The first line of the poem also becomes the last line of the poem from certain footprints found at Lytoli. One, we may imagine they still stroll along, singing perhaps their wordless little song, 
the female smaller maybe than the male, and yet another with them on the trail that leads them either to or back from water. The child who may be this pair's son or daughter, as though to measure up to herself grown, steps into footprints that are not her own. Their tracks laid down three million years ago abruptly end in 80 feet or so, the record of their outing being kept by the volcanic ash in which they stepped, heel before toe, as they went on their way, doing what they might do on any day. And if the course they chose wanted correction, their path extends in only one direction, two. Their path extends in only one direction, and etched into its interrupted section are indications by which we, dis we discover sizes and shapes, lengths of stride, whatever aspects successive footprints may reveal. A depression in the far side of a heel shows that the female carries extra weight on one hip, altering her normal gait. What but an infant can be made of this? And then abruptly, something seems amiss. She halts, pauses, and turns left. Does she sense a difference that makes a difference? Her momentary doubt is one we share, though without knowing what has stopped her there, till she continues. We watch while they recede before us now as signs we've learned to read. Before us now as signs we've learned to read into and out of, it is they who lead and we who follow, haltingly to trace the lineaments of their unhurried pace, our feet stumbling as theirs impress the warm ash with recovered carelessness. Heel before toe, heel before toe, until the trail is discontinued, nada, nil. Since they were there once, once almost in sight, if not quite ever there, no, ever not quite, we may imagine that these four continue at the same pace on to another venue, and at that moment they all disappear and what is left of them found only here on the path they ventured out upon and quit as soon as their footsteps had created it. Four. As soon as their footsteps had created it, rain and another ashfall on the site turned into muck that turned into cement and made their casual passage permanent in printed code that no one had an eye for, or mind until much later to decipher. So could the path be said then to exist? Not till a young paleontologist, out of a welter of competing spores, hyenas, wildcats, rhinos, and wild boars, saw in apparent isolation what could only be the print of someone's foot and then a set of footprints that extended for 80 feet till suddenly it ended, and with it closed off what had been revealed at the beginning of another field. Five. At the beginning of another field, behind him the female burdened with a child, and at his feet the one who sometimes tries his footprints on for size, impatient to get on with it, instead of waiting while he probes what lies ahead for any sign of a better than even chance, the odd turn that will favor their advance, some reassurance I cannot imagine. Whether or not a countersign is given, they must soon realize that if they linger here, they will put their issue into danger. From now on, unrecorded in the dust, the four of them will go forth as they must, and then, if not before, will slip out from 
whatever I can say for sure about them. Six, whatever I can say for sure about them, we, like as not, would not be here without them, without their having set out on their way at a certain hour of a certain day some three and one-half million years ago on a quest whose purpose we can never know that brought them here, where, without meaning to, they left some traces of their passing through. These traces I have come upon and made much of, and my, if my much making has strayed from whatever in the future comes to be thought to have happened, no apology, for errors inescapably are us. The certainty that starts life as a guess, the accidents that generate the plot. We wouldn't be quite human, were they not. Seven, we wouldn't be quite human were they not, however small and far away, one dot in a row of dots that when connected shows a line, a path, a trail of steps that goes from there to here, by which we may infer we are what has become of what they were, as they have been an early state of us on a path once broken, now continuous. We may imagine them, their walk begun, one terrifying moment, morning when the sun was hidden in a cloud of ash and soot, and how they had to walk completely through it until quite suddenly it all came clear. And as they walked on slowly with less fear, the smaller one took up their wordless song. We may imagine they still stroll along. Thank you.